Bonjour and welcome to Secret Paris. I'm author Juliette Sauvenet and today we're so excited to have on our show Jennifer Coburn, best-selling author of the mother-daughter memoir, Will Always Have Paris. Thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer. Thank you for having me, Juliet. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about the book. Uh, well, the book is a memoir following my daughter Katie and I on four trips through Europe, starting and ending in Paris. Our first trip to Paris is when she's eight years old, and then we finish in Paris when she's 16 years old. Oh, okay. And in between, we hit uh, 12 European cities. Wow. Okay, yeah. so this spans over some years and going over eight back. Years, yeah. Okay, wow. And did you have the idea to do the book initially, or did it just start out as, let's go on trips, I want to take my daughter? The first three trips were just for fun. And you know what, the fourth trip was just for fun also, but I knew I would be writing the end of the travel memoir. Okay. When we went back to, well we went to Amsterdam for the first time and then we finished our trip in Paris. So that it went bookend, starting and finishing in Paris. Okay, I love that. Yeah. That's so fun. So what inspired you to take Katie to Paris, had that had you already been to Paris, or you know, I had never been to Paris, and I I wish I could tell you that it was um, my spirit of adventure or um, a delightful joie de vivre, but really, what um, inspired me to take Katie traveling was a fear of dying. Oh no! Yeah, my my dad sadly uh, passed away when he was forty nine years old, and I was nineteen, and I thought, what if I met the same fate? what would be the memories that Katie had of me? And um, I started kind of listening to what she brought up as, an, as important and memorable to her. And she said, oh, remember the time we were in New York and a taxi drove by us and splashed us with water outside of the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in the pouring rain? And remember when we went to Nassau in Florida? And I realized these trips were great ways of creating memories and kind of jam-packing her mental scrapbook with, with beautiful memories of our time together. So I thought, all right, I'm going to take her on a big trip. And I asked my husband if he'd like to join us. He couldn't. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to go to Paris with Katie. Don't speak French. Never been to Paris. But it's, it's a place that... People speak of so fondly and so magically almost that I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna go. Mm -hmm. it was a good idea. <laughs> it, was, it was a great. It was actually the best idea I've ever had. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what did Katie think of Paris? Both like from what was the difference? You know what she thought of it from your first trip to then when she was a little older. You know it's funny that you asked that because. When we were leading up to our first trip, she was eight years old, and people kept asking her, like, oh, are you excited to visit Paris? And she said, I know that Paris is the capital of France, and I know that it's a special place because people ask me the question with a certain reverence and expectation, but she understood Paris, but she didn't really get it until the final day that we were there on our first trip. We're on the top of the Eiffel Tower, and she was holding out her face to the wind, kind of like a dog reaching out the, the back of the car window. And she said, I get it. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, I, I get Paris. Aww. So yeah, it was a lovely moment. Mm -hmm. So that was the first trip. That was, was the first really trip, young. yeah. Okay. And the second trip was completely different because our first trip, we were totally inexperienced travelers. And we didn't know what to expect, we didn't know what to do, and, the, and Katie was quite young. The second trip, she was reading a map, she had her iPhone, she was, she was really, really helpful, mm -hmm. and she was a much more savvy traveler. I say she was, because I, I had not uh, <laughs> matured <laughs> quite, quite as uh, greatly as, as she did. Uh -huh. That's how it goes yeah. for kids, yeah. <laughs> um, so now, do you have any future travel plans to Paris with your daughter? Or I am going to go back to Paris in October. Okay. Uh, Katie is going to college in September, and I realized when that clock hits 219 and school lets out across San Diego, I'm going to be really, really sad. Yeah. So what can I put in my immediate future that I can look forward to so that it's just not a big sob fest every, right. every afternoon? Right. OK, so Paris. Paris, That's yeah. the best way to cope. I yeah. think so. You know, uh, um, as um, 
Audrey Hepburn said, Paris is always a good idea. It is. <laughs> so you're just going on your own? I'm going on my own, Okay, yeah. for how long? Two weeks. Two weeks. And where do you plan to stay, or do you have any favorite things that you're planning to do while you're there? Well, I haven't actually made my uh, lodging arrangements yet, but I'm thinking of a couple of different places on Airbnb so that I can uh, experience different settings. Another writer, um, Claire Fontaine, recommended a hostel called Mija or Miha, and it's right in the third around this month mm -hmm. and she said a lot of writers stay there oh, so neat. yeah so I'm thinking of checking that out okay. and I also I was looking on Airbnb and there's a mother and her five-year-old son who rent out their spare room so oh. that might be fun that would be fun and yeah. have you learned any French from all these trips just a little bit here and there I've learned just enough to get myself in trouble okay yeah. <laughs> that's good I have about 20 words okay that's good you can get by in Paris yeah yeah, yeah. okay I have noticed the difference about uh, in Paris and other European cities is that all Europeans like you to try to speak their language, mm -hmm. but Parisians will really wait for you to um, to attempt French before yeah. they help you out with English. They will. Well, yeah. you know, and they're right. I mean, mm -hmm. here we are in their country. We should right. we should learn it. We should make an effort. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, do you have any plans for a future Paris book? Maybe. Okay. I don't want to go with a contract to write a book about Paris because it's just too much it's too much pressure. Mm -hmm. In fact, the last trip we took to Paris, I knew I was finishing up the book and there were moments when I was like, okay, is this gonna be is this gonna be something I write about? Is this for the book? Please, something interesting happen. And it was a little too much pressure for me and I wanted to let things I want to this time let things happen organically and see if there are stories to tell in a book. Mm -hmm. So I'm going open to the idea mm -hmm. of a new book, but not committed to it. Okay. Yeah, well it would be an interesting angle because after doing the mother-daughter memoir, mm -hmm. and then the daughter goes off to college, and the mother goes to Paris yeah, on her yeah, own, without yeah. your husband, too. Just mm -hmm. you. Yeah, it's just exciting. Me. So, um, do you have any favorite Paris anecdotes or travel stories, either from your time there with Katie, or, um, well, do, you've only been there with Katie, right? I've only okay, been there with Katie. Yeah. There with Katie. Mm -hmm. So, what's your favorite, do you have a favorite travel story from your time there together? Um, well, you know, I have, two and they're they're related um, my cousin Janine is American but she lives in Paris and I had never met her until we visited ten years ago and she married a Frenchman and it was one of our first nights in the city and he took out my street map and unfolded it and he saw the pink stickers for where we we're going to visit Monday and the yellow stickers for where we're going Tuesday and the blue stickers for where we're going to visit Wednesday and he just he just started nodding no <laughs> and he said uh, you know Jennifer um, in order to know Paris you must simply relax have a glass of wine and enjoy life <laughs> <laughs> which, oh, which to me, as, a, as an American mom, was it was such a foreign concept because I have these checklists that I che that I look at every day, and I have an agenda and a plan, and I thought, relax, have a glass of wine, and enjoy life. Like, what, what is? How do you do that? And, and is there a box to check off for that? So, so I said, all right, Katie, let's let's do this. Let's let's relax and just enjoy life. So the next, uh, and a few days later, we were walking down the Seine River, and we happened upon the Shakespeare and Company bookstore, which you know is a beautiful, beautiful bookstore. Um, I think it's a 16th century or 17th century converted monastery, and you know, stacked books from ceiling to floor. Um, it was a cat who lived there, and all these literary events that, that were going on. And what Katie noticed was that discreetly tucked into the bookshelves were cots. Mm -hmm. So we asked the clerk, you know, what, are, what are the cots for? And she said that if you're a young, poor traveler, you can stay in the bookstore in exchange for a few hours of work the next day. Or, if you're a writer, you can stay for free in the writer's studio. Mm -hmm. 
So Katie thought this was a grand idea, and I figured, all right, well, I guess that's what people who enjoy life do. And we did. We checked into the Shakespeare and Company bookstore at midnight when they, after they closed. We were the oldest and the youngest people there by about 10 years. Everybody there was 20 with facial piercings and dyed black hair and, and knapsacks with band pins. And they showed us to the writer's studio where Henry James had once slept. Uh, but they had not changed the sheets since. It was, oh, it was, I mean, we begged to stay there, so I cannot complain and I don't complain, but Katie's bed was not a bed at all. It was um, two file cabinets of, of unequal length, unequal height, a door thrown over it, and a yoga mat on top of that. <laughs> And in the I didn't know they did yoga in Paris. <laughs> well, it was like a soft, soft mat. Mm -hmm. um, in the corner, there was a sink that when we turned it on, um, water didn't come out, but a tornado of gnats came out. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so it was Bastille Day. We went and opened the window because it was really hot and there was, of course, no air conditioning. Mm -hmm. And at the same moment, Katie and I shared our impressions of the writer's studio. Mm -hmm. I said, ugh, I smell hot garbage from the dumpster downstairs. And Katie said, look, we have the most perfect view of Notre Dame. Aww. And I thought, okay, there's a lesson to be learned. That in life, you will be a lot happier if you can hold your nose and focus on what is beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that was one of my favorite Paris stories. It's actually one of the things I'm glad I did, but in the doing it, it wasn't that fun because when I woke up the next morning, and this is gross, um, there were three little mouse turds next to me. Oh. So, um, so it was really not, it was, it was not the best place we ever stayed, but I'm, I'm glad we did it. Yeah, it's a cool experience. Yeah. What a great story. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was so fun to chat with you about Paris. My pleasure. If you're interested in reading more about Jennifer and Katie's adventures in Europe and all through Paris, check out her book, We'll Always Have Paris, and then stay tuned to see if we have another Paris book in Jennifer's future. Thank you.